Essentially, my take on the economy is that what drives the level of income prosperity of, of an economy is the amount of societal know-how it has. It's what is it that it knows how to do. But to understand this concept of, of societal know-how, we have to understand that a society, what a society knows does not really look like what a person knows. Uh, we as individuals are highly limited as, as what it is that we can, we can do. And if you don't believe it, look around at your other economists, how limited is their real capacity to do anything. They barely know how to tie their shoes, I'm sure. So, so uh, the question is, how can you have a society that is able to make airplanes, antibiotics, movies, um, films, and so on, with individuals which are really not that much better than an economist? Uh, and, and the answer is that uh, the way a society gets to know a lot is not by having geniuses, but by having this know-how spread into many, many different heads. So that, you know, if there's a limited amount of know-how that fits in a head, uh, you can get a lot of know-how at the social level by having different bits of know-how at the individual level. Uh, so, so the advance of societal know-how requires uh, the society to increase, if you want, the division of know-how between its members. So the greater the diversity of know-how among the members of a society, uh, the greater the total know-how that the society can, can, can hold. So, so that's my, my essential take on, on what the economy is about. It's about distributing this know-how into different heads, but then to use that know how you have to bring these heads together into uh, you know teams of, of, of people that we call firms and because that's still not enough uh, we need to bring these firms together in networks of firms we might well call the value chain or uh, I'd rather call it the value network so so essentially uh, uh, the economy is this machine that gets constantly generating new know-how, distributing among its members, and then bringing these members together to cooperate uh, to do useful things with this know-how. So that's, that's my fundamental description of the economy. And then the question is, if you take this view to heart, uh, what it is that you would do uh, with it? So one of the things we've done is we've developed a measure of how much does a society know. Um, uh, how to do and, and, and to do that we essentially took um, data sets, matrices of uh, uh, which uh, products or which industries uh, each society holds in uh, uh, whether it's at the national level, what, what products a society is able to export or within a country what, what establishments or what industries, what jobs are in which cities on what industries. So. It's a matrix, if you want, of locations and industries. And then we say, gee, you know, uh, the more you know, the more stuff you should be able to do. So the more diversified you are, uh, the, more, uh, the more you know. But then again, you might say, well, but maybe you are diversified across very simple products, or maybe you make few very complex products. How would I know the difference? So it's, well, if a product is simple, well, everybody should be able to make it. If a product is complicated, few other people are going to be able to make it. So, so maybe you want to know how many other countries are able to make what you make. And that would be sort of like a refined measure of what it is, uh, uh, of how much know-how you have. And then you would say, well, but maybe, maybe you know, the, the things other countries are able to make is affected by the fact that uh, uh, they might be making some products that are rare for some reason and not because they are complex. But if that were the case, then if it was rare because of, say, diamonds are rare, then the countries that make diamonds, a uh, few countries do, you might say, well, it's, are diamonds complex? Well, if they were complex, um, uh, then the people who make diamonds have a lot of know-how. They should be able to make a lot of stuff. But since Sierra Leone, say, or Botswana make very few other stuff, in Faro, maybe that was not a very complex product. So iterating this process, how many products you make, how many products are made by the countries that make the products that you make, how many other countries can make the products that you make, and so on, uh, uh, we derive a, a formula for how much know-how you have. And uh, it's essentially an eigenvalue problem on that matrix. Uh, here you can see the relationship between this metric of how much you know and how rich countries are, uh, controlling for how much they earn in natural resource with natural resources. And you see that it's a pretty impressive relationship. 
it's not a perfect correlation, but it's a pretty high correlation. Now you might say, well, those errors in that relationship indicate that, uh, you know, the theory is not all that hot. Uh, I'd like to interpret them as being that the world is not uh, all that well behaved because these errors, these distances between each observation and the regression line uh, are not just white noise. Uh, they contain information about the future of that economy. Countries that are below the regression line, say like India, this would say have e e enough knowledge to be much richer than they are, and that's why they're growing fast. While other countries at the top, say like Greece, are, uh, are too rich for how little they know. So they should be going down to the regression line. Uh, and actually, we find that uh, these error terms are predictive of future growth. So then next you want to say, well, okay, so how do we accumulate know-how? Well, you accumulate know-how uh, by solving a complicated chicken and egg problem, a coordination problem. Suppose that we're in a country where there are no anesthesiologists and no surgeons. Well, suppose then somebody be studies anesthesiology. Well, that would be rather useless, right? Because the only thing he would be able to do is put people to sleep for no purpose, uh, given that the surgeon is not there. So um, when they're missing capabilities, missing know-how, uh, con countries don't need them because the industries that use them don't exist. Uh, and if you provide one of these missing inputs, a demand for it might be low or insignificant because the other complementary inputs, say like the surgeon and the anesthesiologist, are not there. So we posit that because of this, countries tend to move uh, from the areas there, from the products there, into products that are nearby and nearby in some know-how space. And that's the concept of the product space we developed uh, back in 2007 with, with Cesar Hidalgo and uh, um, Bailey Klinger and, and um, Laszlo Barabashi. And, and uh, we've shown that uh, this product space captures the probability that a country will move in uh, to, from where they are to products that are nearby. So, so that's, that's a, a finding. We also uh, can measure how well positioned a country is in the product space, meaning uh, how close uh, are the things they know how to do from the things they don't know how to do, way by how sexy are those things that they don't know how to do. And so we have these two measures, how much a country knows and how, how easy it would be for it to know more because it's close to other things that, uh, that are sexy. So we have shown that uh, uh, the position of a country in the product space uh, affects uh, the speed at which a society increases its know-how. And you see here a chart that, uh, that uh, shows that. Um, uh, then uh, we take these two variables, how much country I know, knows and, and, and how close it is to, the, uh, to, to other products, uh, to predict uh, how fast it will grow. And this regression works uh, marvelously well. Uh, both variables are informative and they're, they're not uh, collinear, actually. And, um, and so they help explain future growth. And this growth uh, equation beats pretty much everything you throw at it, you know, whether it's the level of education, the quality of the institutions, the depth of the financial system, uh, the competitiveness as measured by the World Economic Forum, and so on. So we have a fairly robust view of, of how growth happens at the aggregate level, but we can use this theory also to explain how growth happens at the industry level at the industry location uh, level. So we can predict how fast an industry is going to grow in a particular location, be that uh, location a country, um, a statistical metropolitan area of the US, an Indian district. So we can predict growth at the local industry level using uh, this framework. Uh, we can also uh, predict not just, you know, changes, you know, growth up and down, we can predict complete appearances and disappearances of industries. Industries that were nowhere there, uh, but will be there in the future. We can predict that with surprising precision. Uh, to, to measure that precision, we use this concept of the area under the curve of the ROC operator. I won't go into it, but you see, uh, essentially, you, you graph uh, the true positive rate of your predictor to the, true, to the false positive rate, 
and the closer you are to a straight line to the top, it, it, uh, it, the better the predictor. And these, these predictors are surprisingly good. In fact, they are between 5 times and 12 times uh, better than a random guess uh, in, in, in predicting uh, which industries will appear where. So as you've seen, uh, this is an approach we are constantly keep on working on this approach that the, the economy is this machine that processes and uses societal know-how, that the accumulation of societal know-how is what drives prosperity, that it goes through some very peculiar channels that we're trying to uncover, and that uh, there's plenty of work uh, to keep on doing. Thank you very much.